Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. And in this podcast, we interview thinkers, researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. On today's episode, I wanted to focus on a piece of our cities, which I've always found, I have to admit, a bit boring. Uh, it's a topic that it's dominated by engineers. I thought there was nothing new, you know, since the invention of sliced bread. And I, I then read more about it. And it seems that, well, wait, wait, hang on, there is something more about it, especially if we want to reduce the environmental impacts of existing and new cities, then this is a key element. And if you haven't figured it out already, I'm talking about infrastructures. Indeed, infrastructures and urban infrastructures are and will dictate the way our flows are circulating within our cities and how to reduce them. And I think they also have um, a hidden political and in urbanistic implication. To talk about infrastructures, we have uh, with us today Sybil Derbel, who has written and edited two books and written countless articles on the topic. He is an associate professor of urban engineering in the Department of Civil Materials and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois of Chicago, uh, and the director of the Complex and Sustainable Urban Networks Lab. What I, I'm reading now from his uh, bio, his research uh, interests include the planning, design, and modeling of urban infrastructures. More particularly, he looks both at the supply and demand for infrastructure, and he looks at the nexus of uh, building, water, electricity, gas, telecom, transportation, and even solid waste infrastructures as they are ubiqu ubiquitous element. That's a difficult word to pronounce uh, in our cities. And so his main goal is to rethink infrastructure planning and design practices and inform new policies to help design smart, sustainable, and resilient cities. So that is a perfect fit to introduce us to the topic of urban infrastructure. So thanks again, Sybil, for being on the podcast. And please let us know who you are and tell us a bit more about your work. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of big words there. Um, <laughs> So I'll try to make it a little bit simpler. So yeah, so I'm, I'm Sybil. Um, I'm originally French, uh, but I lived in I live in the US. Um, I, I've been here for the past nine years. I've really enjoyed uh, being in Chicago. I love Chicago, but originally, so I'm French, but I'm not from mainland France. I'm from one of those overseas territory that France has. And France, not many, not many people know that, but France has a lot of islands everywhere in the world. Some really nice one, tropical islands in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, and in the Pacific Ocean. And it's got a tiny, tiny, tiny island in the frigid cold of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, really close to Canada, called St. Pierre and Miquelon. Uh, it's 6,000 people. It's off the coast of Canada and the US, but it's French owned. So that means I'm a French citizen. Um, I, 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 we have the Euro there. I went for the French president. I went through the French uh, school system. And the fact that I'm from an island, I think makes a lot of sense for, for the fact that I'm looking at, at infrastructure and, and all of them is because it was just around me and I know how the island had to, to operate. So when you're on the island, you know, like, like everywhere else, you come from electricity, you come from water, you know, your wastewater has to go somewhere, there's a transport system. And I actually do have access to all the places. I have access to the power plant, to the water treatment plant. And so that really got me to think of um, all those infrastructure systems. Again, not looking individually at, at one of them, which is typically the way that we do in engineering, typically the way that we uh, educate uh, engineers is by asking them to specialize into one infrastructure systems um, um, over others. So that's, that's really it. So, you know, I'm just, you know, from that island, I'm very curious. Uh, I did not like infrastructure in the first place. I really didn't like it because it was, yeah, really boring. Like you're saying, really, really boring. Um, I got into engineering because I was fairly good in high school. And when you're fairly good in high school, and especially in math, you know, it's kind of common to go to engineering. And I thought after engineering, I would go into business. Um, and, and I went to my engineering school. I went, I did that in the UK, actually. Um, so from France, I went to the UK. Very French then, way, actually. When you have, you know, good grades in math, what you're going to do is engineering. That's always the... Oh, well, it's always. So you do one of those schools and then you do, you know, in engineering and then you do whatever, whatever else. Um, 
So I, I went to France and then I went to the UK. When I was there, I got to do a bit of research. Um, and I, and I really, really enjoyed it. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm just a very curious person. I just like to learn. Um, uh, and then I, I just, yeah, I just really, really enjoyed it. I really like transportation in particular because I thought transportation has a way to go into engineering, into politics, into economics, into social urban planning. Uh, so that was really my, my, my foot into the world of, of civil engineering because my undergrad was in another kind of engineering. And then I got very lucky and I did my, uh, my, my PhD with Chris Kennedy in Toronto. And Chris Kennedy is someone who looks at all those infrastructure systems. And so it was perfect for me. Uh, so I was mainly focusing on transportation when I was with him, but I was really exposed to buildings and water and wastewater, electricity, natural gas, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really what I'm doing now. And it's, it's funny because, and then, you know, when you look around, if you're in a city anywhere, you just look around, it's full of infrastructure. It went from being boring to being fascinating. Mm -hmm. And now wherever I go in the world, I just look around, I study infrastructure, and I see everything that's common between cities and everything that's very different. Um, so, right, you go from boring to fascinating very quickly. Yeah, but it's uh, <laughs> it, it is funny because this is the importance of looking at the things that do not seem important uh, in the first place. And once you get it, then you see it everywhere. It's like the new words that you once heard for the first time, and then you hear it all of the time. It's more or less exactly. the same with infrastructures. Yeah. Um, well, and, yeah. And, and even with my students, right? Like I, I ask them when I see them, I say, when you open your tap, do you have water that comes out? It's like, yes. Where does the water come from? And then they don't really know. Or sometimes they say, well, it comes from the lake. I say, all right, when you have, when you do trash, when you don't want your trash, where do you put it? Well, in the, in the garbage, where does it go after? You no know, people, they, they buy garbage truck, they pick it up. Where does it go after? They have no idea. And just asking those questions um, just really makes you curious about the, the place where you live. Yeah, yeah. I love this kind of urban investigation, more or less, that it, It, it lets you know what your city is. It gives you like a, a small magnifying glass and you look at things. One of the things I, I really enjoy is when I go to cities, I take pictures of the sewage plates or the electricity grids and all of that. They have oh, yeah. small plates and very frequently it is made by the city themselves, right? It's written the name mm -hmm. of the city. And then you have like, I don't know, energy system or uh Uh, or you know gas supply or something like that and it provides like what is the pressure of uh, of the pipes or something like that and it, it's very nice because it tells you also some you know some chronological elements of your city it tells you how does you how did your city evolve developed it tells you like okay electricity arrived at that moment in that city or You know, in, in Paris, where, where you, you spent a, a bit of your sabbatical, you had this very little famous plaque that is gaz aux étages, like you had natural gas yeah. in the above um, uh, stories. And, well, it tells you a lot about how a city evolved and you don't see it. But, I mean, even behind you, we, we see so much of it and we don't even think about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny that you're looking at those plates, right? Most people don't, don't really care. Most people don't even question it. You always think it's the sewers, but it's not necessarily the sewers. Um, and when you start reading about it, you actually learn about the, the city itself. Um, and and I love, by the way, I love your term urban investigation. I think I, I'll bore it. I think it's phenomenal. It's great. Thanks. Well, you can send your, your students do some urban investigations. I did some workshops with kids back in the day, and we were connecting these plates of... Uh, you know, water and electricity. And we had like some small stencils with uh, graffiti, um, how you call it, uh, bombs or, you know, like spray, can, can. spray cans. Yeah. Uh, and we were connecting the dots. And so they were kind of following the thread of where did it came from? And then they see, uh, they saw a transformator and they said, oh, okay, that's the, the second node. And then another node and all of that. And well, Thankfully, we had called the police uh, before doing that, so I don't recommend to do it uh, just on your own. But it's really, it really uh, builds a mindset, I think, to to people. Once you see it, then you know it's baked in your brain, and you you continue watching that. I'll, I'll do that activity. It sounds <laughs> it sounds really amazing. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. Um, how how big was uh, Saint Pierre and Miquelon? Um, so in terms of population, it's 6,000. It's very small in terms of uh, surface area. The whole thing is 250 square kilometers. Okay. Most people live in Saint Pierre, which is 40 square kilometers. So we imagine six kilometers by eight. Okay. Um, so very, very small. Very small. Yeah. 
Yeah, so and isolated. So, so you know everything, as you said. You you walked everything around. So you you yourself know the 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 infrastructures. I mean, you could probably name them uh, or draw them or something. Oh like. no, yeah. Well, no, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And and even if you don't know, you feel comfortable just calling the person. Yeah. Right. So I, I go back every two years or so now, and so I try to always do something. So one year I visited the power plant. One year I visited the water treatment plant. One year I visited the new solid waste management facility that we have. Um, and I just ask people, do you know who takes care of it? Yeah, yeah. Here, here's here's the number <laughs> of the person. Go call them up, you know. And I just go for it. And they're and they're normally very happy to talk about it. Um, that's also something else that I, I recommend to everyone is usually the people who operate the infrastructure are passionate about them. Uh, so if you just call them up or try to go and, and meet with them and talk with them, they'll be super happy to tell you about what they're doing. Um, so it's, oh no, urban investigation is worth it and all the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you did your, your PhD with Chris Kennedy, who is uh, like one of the persons that, uh, you know, raised urban metabolism out of the ashes because, you know, it existed back in the 60s and 70s, but kind of died off. And then Chris and uh, Sabine Barl and another, you know, a small group of uh, researchers kind of in the end of 1990s, early 2000s, let's say, they kind of picked it up. And now it's like a solid uh, investigation field or, you know, it has many sub-disciplines and all of that. So I'm, I'm wondering how was it to, to do your PhD with him? Because uh, it was at that moment that UM, urban metabolism, you know, uh, had a renaissance moment. And I can imagine that you looking at the infrastructures in a systemic way perhaps has a also a, an inspiration from urban metabolism. I mean, you, you are always very close to urban metabolism, right? So absolutely. So I'll tell you, Chris, so it's funny. It's really like a, like a family, you know, when you, when you grow up in a family, um, there are a lot of things that your parents do that they don't tell you to do, but you just see them doing and you kind of do the same thing. So Chris has always had his students who were doing kind of their stuff and he kept doing his research, you know, on the side. So he was teaching, you know, the full thing is that, you know, it's really important for him to keep doing research. And so I wasn't necessarily doing urban metabolism, but he was doing all of these things. And you just learn from that. So he never told me that it was a good thing to do. I just looked at him. I did my thing. So I focus mostly on, uh, on tr public transportation networks. Um, so networks, network science, looking at networks, the structure of the networks was, was very, very big in the late. So 2000s, you know, up to 2010, 2012. And now it's, it's less, less big, but it was very, very big. So I studied uh, public transmission networks from a networks perspective, not necessarily urban metabolism, but my colleagues were doing something related to other infrastructure systems. They were doing their own things, sometimes related to urban metabolism, sometimes not. And then Chris was doing his own thing as well. And so you just learn from all of that. And he definitely um, um, infected me with that, with that desire to, to look at urban infrastructure systems though completely um, one of the reasons why he was, I think, one of the first ones is because there was very, very little data. So urban metabolism means multi-infrastructure, and multi-infrastructure means that you need to get data from a lot of places. Uh, we've always had a lot of data when it comes to transportation, or at least how it's from the 1950s or 60s. Uh, before the others, it was much more complicated. And so it was really uh, an investigation job for him to go and to try to get data from all those places. And it was really, yeah, I mean, it, it took a long time. So I think that's why... Um, he was one of the early people to revitalize urban metabolism and to do well. And, um, and yeah, and he really instilled in me that the desire to look at, at, at everything. Um, so again, so I did transportation, then I went for my postdoc. And then when I took my, my job, I really wanted to look at all those infrastructure systems. Plus, we know that we know that the way cities operate right now is not sustainable. We know that we consume too much energy. Uh, we consume too many resources. Something has to change. Um, some people think it's going to be all about technology. So using having the same systems, but using technology to change everything. I, I, I'm pretty much sure that you know, people have completely debunked uh, that now. Um, so we know it's going to be, it's going to require a lot of social change. Um, so, you know, we'll have to work a lot of people, cultural change, social change, we'll have to change the way we live. Uh, but I also think that the way that infrastructure itself is set, and especially the interconnections, interrelationships between infrastructure also has a big part to play in it. Uh, and that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on. Um, so, yeah, so it, Chris infected me with that desire, I think, to look at everything. With, well, well, at least he showed me that it was possible to look at everything. 
Um, and that's what I've been doing for the past, I don't know, I mean, yeah, at least 10, 15 years. Um, and it's been great. Yeah, it seems that there is no end. Of course, you can never have an answer at the end and say, okay, I got it now. I can stop research. You know, I mean, there is always this other oh, yeah. layer or, you know, another time in space or another time in, in time or, you know, point in time or something like that. You never finish that, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's really ironic when you think of it because infrastructure by definition is built by humans. So it was built by humans over decades or even centuries. And now we don't even know how they work <laughs> because it was piecemeal bit by bit, you know, and system by system. We don't know how the whole thing works together. Right. I mean, it's, it's really quite incredible. And so I'm really trying to do that again, investigation piece, I guess, of saying, all right, so we've done this thing. How does it actually work? Um, and, and it's interesting and it's not supposed to be that complex. I mean, I'm not a biologist. I mean, the human body is tremendously complicated, you know, or, or, or living organisms. Uh, infrastructure is something that we built. So it's not supposed to be that complicated, but it, it actually quite is. So yeah, yeah it, it's fun. It's a bit of a Frankenstein baby where with, you know, limbs that you attach to it every time and it's like a never ending uh, weird yeah. organism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned networks uh, on uh, your PhD that you studied the, the transportation systems as networks. What, what were the insights when we study them as, as networks? Yeah, yeah. So here's here's what's happening. So a network is a system, right? You have a system. Normally, we have nodes and we have we have links. Uh, for the longest time, especially in transportation, we were really looking at the flows. Mm -hmm. So the flows on the link. So there's a lot of traffic on one road versus another. What can we do to alleviate traffic? So the flow was the whole thing. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, there's that science of network science that came about. And the main thing about that science is that the structure of the network itself. So not the flows, but the structure of the network itself, the number of links, the number of nodes, how they're connected. That really has um, huge implications on what the network can and cannot do. And so, um, and again, just the structure and not the flows. And so I started to look at the structure of public transportation systems. I started to look at networks. I started to measure some network properties, and number of links, number of nodes, number of links over number of nodes, number of connections. This is really a bunch of things that you can um, calculate, which are the most central nodes, so the most central stations, what's the most central station, the second most, third most, and then you can calculate metrics, and then you can compare them with subway systems over you know, public transportation. I mainly looked at metro over the world, and you see that there are many um, common features, which was really odd because all those systems evolved in their own city by their own planners for different reasons based on you know, completely different I don't know, social dynamics, but they all shared some properties. Um, and, and so just really you know, measuring, witnessing, identifying those properties was, was very, very interesting. Um, and, and, and I remember at the beginning when I was trying to publish my work, the transportation people really don't understand. It's like, no, no, that, I mean, that's just a network. I mean, that's not important. It's all about the flows. I mean, that's what matters. Like, no, 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 look, the network property really has you know, a big impact. And it really, yeah, so it took time for them. But then once they, they saw it, um, a lot of people started to use network science in, in transportation. And you, so again, really purely the structure. And you mentioned yeah. properties. What, what are these common properties? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few. One of them is, um, there's, there's a very simple one, which is how many nodes, how many stations have a lot of transfer stations or a lot of transfers to other lines how many nodes don't really have any transfers or maybe just to one other line? And when just you think about it, you know, think about a city, think about a, you know, ideally a city with a, with a metro system, how many big stations do you have? How many smaller stations do you have? And just count them. And if you count them, you plot on them on the graph, you're going to see that it's going to follow a certain curve. Mm. And that curve usually really, you know, you have a lot of stations with uh, very, very few transfers and very few stations with a lot of transfers and follows kind of that like this, and this here actually has some implications um, and depending on whether it goes down very fast or not as fast. I always give the example of, of Tokyo because Tokyo is one uh, system that has some very, very large stations, but it also has quite a few stations with just a few transfers, maybe two transfers or three transfers. So when you're in Tokyo, it's very easy if a station is, is not operating, is not working, it's very easy to find an alternative path to go somewhere. Uh, and that contrasts with Chicago, where I am, for example, because in Chicago, almost everything goes to the loop, the yeah. downtown. 
And uh, so if you want to go from, uh, I don't know, from, from west to south, you have to go downtown first. You can't bypass it. And so that has implications in terms of, of resilience. So you talked a little bit about resilience before, but it had, has really strong implications. And these, I don't think, are things that we initially thought about before we actually measured those, those properties. Hmm. Yeah, and it's nice always to to put some figures and some intuitions. You know, I mean, when you see, I guess, uh, the metro plan of uh, of Chicago, you can see that it does not work, or you can experience it does not work. But adding numbers to it, it kind of adds a robustness to to why or what are some features that we should plan for future infrastructures. I guess exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That intuition, you need to prove that it's actually there, and 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 we did. That was nice. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I mean, I I got a bit um, familiar with these and all of the allometric stuff from uh, you know Betancourt and and all of these. Actually, he was in Chicago. Is he still in Chicago? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. He moved here, I think, uh, yeah, a few years ago. He is. Yeah, yeah. That was a a whole new topic of urban metabolism, which. Uh, I'm still digesting. I don't know how comfortable I am with uh, treating cities as static, uh, you know, entities uh, and all of that. But I think it's a, a very interesting way to to look at cities. You know, regardless of what scale, are you going to look at them? Are you going to look at them at a building level, at the city level, and compare them? Or you know, what is the right scale for analysis? Uh, and I think you know, when you work with well, networks, so that's the same thing, right? Yeah, so the right scale and the right, um, so that whole science by, the, by those people, uh, it's called urban science or the science of cities. It's Ben and Court, it's Mike Batty. Uh, there's quite a few people. And there the goal is really try to measure if there are common properties or, or among cities. So, and that's all part of something called complexity science or complexity theory. And complexity theory is where you have a lot of things happening we have a system with tons of agents. Everything is happening. Uh, there's no order necessarily. You know, people do whatever they want. There's no central command that's directing so for some things to happen. And yet, when you look at the whole thing together, you measure some some emerging order. There's order that's just there that emerges. Uh, the best analogy that I have for that is the Invisible Hand by Adam Smith for for in in the economy. Uh, so there are market forces that are there, and it's you know it's putting some order when there's no central command. And so that was also happening with the development of, of cities. And we can actually measure some of those. Um, although the, the math gets tricky sometimes, but that's what uh, Bettencourt did for, for a long time and, and Batty as well. Uh, all that was very, very hot, I think, until maybe 2012, 13, maybe 14. Uh, but then came machine learning and machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence really overtook everything since then. So right now, I think for the past five, six years, it's all been about natural language processing and deep learning and, and all these things. And I do a lot of them, you know, and it, it's fun, uh, but I, I don't know what's going to be next. I don't <laughs> know if urban science is going to come back or not. We'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, so I guess you, you have, um, how you call it, you, you are quite advanced in the analytical techniques that you use, right? I mean, uh, I can imagine that through this network and now you, you mentioned machine learning, uh, you also mentioned intel um, artificial intelligence and all of that. So I guess we we can go in the future by, we can start understanding cities in more in-depth ways, in more predictive ways, I guess, start modeling stuff as well, because so far we're a bit looking at the past and try to make a correlation of, you know, what happens uh, if we have sufficient points in time or sufficient, you know, um, units, let's say neighborhoods, and we have a, a sample big enough so that we can make, a, you know, any correlation or any yep. modeling. Uh, but I can imagine this will be extremely useful for forecasting, for modeling, for testing scenarios such as, okay, what happens if we have this infrastructure or the other? So I can imagine that these advanced techniques are are going to be really helpful but can you let us know how will that evolve or what 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 are they so, about um, so yeah no modeling so I, I so i actually never really did any modeling i'm not a big model i never considered myself a big modeler uh, for my phd i did no modeling no coding whatsoever and then i i i saw that it was not that modeling was a thing and i saw that more coding more python was a thing so i started to learn python and and I, and I was surprised by how easy it was. It was way easier than I expected it would be. 
Uh, and so I learned bit by bit. And the more you learn, the more you know about it. Um, and then you become the modeler. Uh, but I'm, I, I don't have the modeling fiber inside of me. It's just something that I do because it's, it, was, it was fun. Again, I'm just a curious person. It was fun, intellectually, you know, fun at, at the beginning. Um, so mo- you use modeling for, for in, in modeling for different purposes. We usually think only about the forecasting purposes, the testing policies purposes. That's the second one. The first purpose where you're doing it usually is for something called inference. And inference means you're trying to learn about your system. So we see that things are happening. We have some intuitions that we discussed before. But then when you develop a model and you see that, oh, one variable over another is important. For example, oh, income. Oh, if you have a higher income, you're more likely to drive. If you have a lower income, you might, you're more likely to use another mode, for example. Or, oh, if you live closer to the city, you're more likely to um, use transit. Or if you live in the suburbs far away, you're more likely to drive. So all of that is inference. And there's, there, there are things that we know are going to be there and it's kind of obvious, but others that are not necessarily obvious. And in particular, the ranking of which variable is more important over others. So that's where, for me, was really, really fun um, and so for the longest time, I focused purely on the infrastructure side, uh, like the, 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 the supply side of infrastructure. And more and more, I go, I go to the demand of the infrastructure of services. So I try to model water consumption. And so when I try to model water consumption, it's not try to forecast how much water we're going to use. It's to understand how people consume water. And, in, you know, you know, and one of them in particular is the impact, for example, of the number of people in the household. If you have two people, do they consume twice as much as if you have one person? Uh, and if not, is their relationship? And that's where something like those more novel techniques, you know, and that's where we're going to go into machine learning and things like that, um, are really good just because fundamentally they work differently from what we used before. And they don't have a lot of the assumptions that, that the other techniques that we used before had. The biggest one is linear. So before we would assume that if you have two people in their household, they consume twice as much as one person. Uh, if you have three people, they consume you know, three times as much as one person. Now with machine learning, you don't assume that anymore. So, and the way machine learning works is you have some kind of, um, uh, you have a fairly complicated, uh, I'm gonna say model, but you have something and the machine just learned by itself and just picks up by itself some of the behaviors. And so what we do after is we look at what did the model learn and what can we learn uh, from that? And that's where it's becoming a lot of fun. So for me, it's really all about inference. So inference of how people consume water inference about travel behavior. Um, so transportation is, is a field that was far advanced, more advanced than others for the longest time because they have those big transportation model. More and more other systems are catching up, uh, but how do people actually um, yeah, choose their, their travel mode? Now what I'm doing increasingly is trying to look at those interrelationships between infrastructure systems. So we have water, electricity, gas. Normally if you're in a house, for example, and there are more people, you're going to consume more water, more electricity, more, more gas if you have gas. Um, but these two are interrelationships. Sometimes you consume more, sometimes you don't consume as much. So just learning about all that is really what I'm trying to do right now. Eventually, I'm going to go into forecasting. Uh, but again, I'm not a, I don't have that modeling fiber inside of me. I have that curious fiber inside of me that wants me to understand how the world works, but not that modeling fiber, we'll see. But then you were talking about all those models and eventually where... Um, where I think where we say we want to go, I don't know if that's really where we want to go, but where we say we want to go is to something called a digital twin of the city. And the digital twin is when you have the city is happening, we have a replica of the city as a model, and we're trying to model people behaving and you know, consuming electricity and water and, and also even how the infrastructure responds. So one of the big ones is um, whenever it rains a lot. So flooding is a problem for, for many, if not most cities in the world extreme flooding and extreme droughts. Some cities, you know, almost at the, at the same time, they see like Phoenix, for example, as extreme drought and then it really torrential floods. Um, so that water goes to the sewer system. You know, where does it go? Is the sewer system going to be overwhelmed or not? All of that we can model. And what we do now is we have a wastewater model that's sitting here, transport model that's sitting here, et cetera, et cetera. So digital twin is supposed to combine everything together. So that's the theory. I think that's what we, that's what we say where we want to go. Really, right now, we're using that goal as an excuse to try to learn about, you know, um, the different systems together, to try to look at even thinking in a completely different way how we can model these things, just because we have those huge monolithic model that looks at individual systems. I don't know if we can really have them talk to one another, but we might think about the future of modeling. Um, And so it's just a good discussion to be in. And 
being on both sides, so being on the side away from modeling for the longest time, I remember being very, um, uh, I think the word is intimidated, um, yeah. intimidated, and yeah, by, by the fact that, oh, they know all those models, they know all that math, it's really crazy, it's, it's like, wow, um, I can't do that, and, and when that happens very quickly, I think you become a bit defensive, so you just look at the wrong things about the math models, oh, but they, they assume this, they assume that, that's crap, that doesn't work as opposed to saying, well, these models have something to, to say. Part of it is real, part of it is not real. It's not about saying the models gives me out a result. That's the, that's the truth. But it's about saying, oh, that actually helps me to make a decision. Um, uh, again, when I was doing my PhD, one of the faculty members there was Eric Miller. Eric Miller is a big person in transportation. And he was saying for him, the model is just one voice around the table. So it's not the voice that you're going to listen to, but if you have a you know, different experts and you have the model, it's one of the voices that you're going to listen to to, to make some decisions. Yeah, what is uh, I don't know who said that, uh, but it goes like uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful or something like that, or some yeah. are, are helpful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that box. I forget his first name. His last name is Box, like a box. Yeah. And I think it was in the 1970s. And he said that for something completely different, but transport people have, have really taken that to heart. How models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to unpack there. I think, so for the longest of time, when I did my PhD, I was looking at the drivers of urban metabolic flows. So mm -hmm. what does drive, you know, water consumption, what does drive energy consumption, all of that. Um, and so... I, I tried to go to different or to look for data in different cities. And over there, the only way for me to, to do a, a good comparison between socioeconomic and territorial organization characteristics of a city and metabolic flows, you would need to have spatial data, right? You would need to have a sample big enough to be able to do such relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started with Brussels because that's what I had in, uh, in hand. They had 19 municipalities. Um, and so there was public data about how much, you know, uh, water, natural gas, electricity, uh, was consumed in these municipalities. And then what was the unemployment rate? What was the income levels? What is the, the density, the number of buildings, the square meters of buildings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I tried to make relationships and, it got blurry, of course. There, there wasn't like there was like big, um, let's say, insights, but nothing actionable. Let's say. Mm -hmm. However, what I I saw and was fascinating is that the way you ask the question of what is the main driver of that, and the metric that you use, then you're going to get different answers. So, if you measure, let's say, consumption by consumption per capita, or if you measure it absolute, or if you me measure it per square meter or per anything else, and then you do the same relationship, uh, then you're going to find a different order of these municipalities or other variables are, diff are more significant. Mm -hmm. And so I find the way that we ask questions as important as the answer. And very frequently, we just you know, model through all of this and we say, okay, this is the driver of energy, but yeah, but what energy and how do you account for energy? And is it the right way to account for it? And yeah, and then of course you you stumble upon the, the limits of that availability. Like there are no, not a lot of cities that have accurate data at a small level. So Chicago is one of the best cities because they have like, I think at a zip code level, they have, electricity or was it energy use uh, data, which is like fantastic because you have, I don't know, 3000 zip codes or something like that. So that's a fantastic case study, but how do we then, you know, people from data poor countries or data poor cities will say, well, this is nice and all, but how do we do it? Or how do we advance in this field? Yeah, no, no, yeah. And, and then otherwise you say, all right, so we have all that energy data. Let's try to co let's compare energy to transportation. And then we don't have transportation data at that level. Exactly. Um, so we get stuck very quickly. You know, I, I, I like what you're saying a lot because I, I think fundamentally the, the brain, the way our brain works is very, very limited. Uh, when we get overwhelmed with information, we don't really know what to do. So we simplify everything. Right? We just abstract a lot of complicated stuff into very simple rules that we can act on. And so for us as researchers, 
uh, we, we, we want to try not to do that. <laughs> we want to try to have a more accurate picture, but we still get overwhelmed, right? With all of that information. And it is very difficult. Um, and and that's, that's also why I think I like, so I do work with uh, some researchers, especially in those silos. And when mm -hmm. I show them you know, and I tell them about my work, they tell me, well, but that's the wrong kind of data. You can't do that because there's no relationship necessarily between this and this. It's like, well, there's a story there to tell. We can learn something. Let's work on that. And they're so used to being super rigorous into the finest thing of their field that they're very uncomfortable um, dealing with, with that much uncertainty. Uh, and I, but I surf on that uncertainty. I, I, I love yeah. that. So I'm fine with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I completely feel the, the same way is that I, I, I'm not an energy specialist and not an infrastructure specialist and not a sociologist. So I'm probably wrong from every point of view, but there is no single person in the middle that has it right as well. So there is, you know, <laughs> this uh, middle piece where everybody can still be not wrong, which is I'm fine with it. <laughs> No, yeah. So someone told me at some point, it's like, well, okay, so you have to be careful not to become a jack of all trades, master of none. That's a yeah. very famous English expression. Jack of all trades, master of none means, you know, a little bit of everything, but you know, not an expert into anything. And I thought about that. And after a while, I thought, no, we need some people like this. <laughs> we need some people with those interests in, in everything, you know, to kind of glue everything together. So that doesn't mean that we're more right than the others. But I think there's a need in, in the world, at least in the, you know, the world that we're living uh, for people like this. And so like, like you, you know, I mean, I'm in that position. I'm very comfortable with it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. And even if it's not what they recommend, I mean, we feel comfortable. So yeah, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> uh, then I, I also enjoyed, so you mentioned, you know, the, the digital twins. Uh, I think now people are, are also trying to go from, you know, building information models to city information models and probably they're more or less the same thing what what i what i also enjoy in this I, I still haven't figured it out at all so i see this a bit like a as you say like a 3d maquette of, of a city or a 3d model of, of a city i haven't yet seen the the use of it or the application of it I, i'm still a bit waiting for it to happen because i, I see okay we have 3d buildings and we might even have the infrastructures and it's real time monitoring for some stuff, not for others. That That's fine. But I haven't yet, you know, seen how do we, you know, group perhaps uh, one field yep. of uh, urban metabolism, you know, there's material stock modeling. So we could say in the city information model, okay, I have that much still in my city. And then you can take an action on that. And I think this modularity, knowing that, this piece belongs to that piece belongs to that piece and there's certain you know no you cannot just sell a window you need to sell i don't know the frame with it or something like that you know some conditions yep. that then tell us well this is why you can't recycle that much or this is you know or economically that's the amount of money you will save by planning infrastructure in the same way so i think there are some you know, uh, no, decision making things that, uh, yeah. So it's exactly, I think what I told you before, which is we say that the goal is to develop those big models. I don't think that really, that's really what the goal is. Um, I, I think we're just trying to learn bit by bit. So you have the people who just want to make a model, an accurate model, no matter what, and they completely forget the big picture of, you know, why do we want to use that model for? Um, so so I, I think that's where we are. So we're still trying to figure out, you know, we're going in that direction. Still trying to figure out how we're going to use it, what we're going to do with it, um, and I and I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I think part of it is uh, uh, again cultural change is needed. So cultural change within academia to know why we're doing something, uh, and we're just learning bit by bit as we go through it. Um, you know, and talking about metabolism, urban metabolism. I know one of the biggest complaints about urban metabolism is that it's a diagnostic tool, right? So we use it. We know how things are. We don't know what the right solution is. And I think it's kind of, you know, it's similar as well. You know, we're just going to try to, you know, bit by bit, we, we advance, we go forward, we see how things are, and we just adapt. Now, if we stay here at the beginning, say, oh, once we have that big model, there's nothing we can do with it. So we should not do it. I don't think it's the right thing to do. Um, no, no, yeah. Saying, you no, know, we should put all our, you know, investment funding into this because those big models are going to solve all the problems. I don't think it's the right thing to do. 
Um, but a little bit, right? A little bit, bit by bit, is going to make a big difference. And it's incredible also how much I see change in what I've mentioned before, which is you know, social, cultural change, the way that we think. So my, for me, you know, I see those, those, the, all those technical things to be there bit by bit. And hopefully when they're ready, when they're mature, we have all that cultural change that has happened. And then we can leverage these things uh, to do something um, different. Uh, and that's especially important, I think, in infrastructure because, because the way we're going to consume infrastructure or the way we're going to use infrastructure in the future is not the same that we're going to use it now. And it's incredible how people are trapped into thinking that something that's here now will be like that forever. And I have my students and I tell them, it's like, you know, the Department of Transportation did not exist before the 1960s. And there's a lot of things that are there now. We just assume that that's it. People want that. They've always wanted that. They're always going to want that. And no, it's going to change, right? It's absolutely going to change. Um, so I think it's a, you know, it's, it's multiple things that you kind of bring forward together and you hope that at some point there's a synergy and they're going to come together. Um, knowing that we're never going to solve all the problems of the world, there's always going to be new problems, but, you know, if we couldn't do it t together, right, together. So. Yeah. No, no, of course, it's a, it's a daunting task, but I, I still see the, the progress uh, every year and we still get, you know, we, we're now in places where we couldn't have imagined, I think, when, when I started research. So I, I think we're getting there. I, you know, you, you said it right as well. There are some fancy words such as smart cities and stuff like that, which sometimes are, are a bit cringy that, yeah, I mean, technology and sensors and all of that is fantastic. I mean, I, I love when there is accurate data and real-time data. Don't I don't say that, but what do you do with them then? What, what is the answer that you want to, uh, what is, sorry, the question that you want to answer and can, will it change as well? Because what, what I've, I think the one thing I learned from studying urban metabolism for now almost 10 years is that you have the theory, you can propose theoretical answers uh, or pr proposals or actions, but they never work, right? I mean, <laughs> they don't yeah. get adopted. And this yeah. is because of political will, this is because of et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, great, you're going to have a lot of data, but nobody's going to use it, or they're going to use it against what you want. So, you know, data is, is nice, but at the end of the day, there is a lot of, I think, negotiations, a lot of thinking how you're going to achieve your goal. And I think this is especially, I mean, you mentioned it, you, you're now working into the nexus of infrastructures, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's a layer even more complex of before. Uh, so I can imagine that there is a optimization or perhaps optimization is a big word, but at least you can, uh, you know, plan infrastructures as a system instead of individual ones. And therefore you can probably reduce requirements of energy, requirements of materials, requirements of, uh, you know, emissions of CO2 and all of that. Have you started a bit? So, that? so that's a phenomenal question. Um, I, I really don't like the word optimization. I yeah. don't do any optimization. I don't do any operations research. Um, uh, and that's, you know, partly coming from resilience when, when you optimize something, you're just really going to make it vulnerable to something because it's optimized for, for a certain thing. The way I think about it right now is not so much um, to optimize all the system together. It's to identify. So I always say infrastructure are interdependent. They're interrelated. Uh, right now, those interdependencies are limiting factors. They limit what we can do. Mm. Um, they just happen like this. Uh, we have a water pump. It requires electricity, so we depend on the water, on the electricity, uh, on the electric utility, and that's a limiting factor. Now, if we identify those, maybe we can transform them from being limiting factors to enabling factors. What does that actually mean? I'm not too sure, and I don't think we want to have, you know, is one entity planning for everything but at least we know they're there and they're enabling factors. Uh, my favorite quote for that is from an artist uh, called Frank Stella. So Frank Stella is an American artist who was a minimalist in 1960s, 70s, and then he completely changed and he had those canvases and he really emerged from the canvas. So if you look at his art, it's, it's pretty, it's grand, it's, it's really nice, it's, it's pretty big. And I remember visiting, um, well, going to see one of these exhibitions and there was a quote and it was a long quote, but at the end, you know, it really says basically that boundaries 
the boundaries, and that was in the, 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 the context of the canvas, boundaries are defining but not limiting. And I love that. Boundaries are defining but not limiting. It really spoke to me, you know, it really resonated with me. No, transportation is transportation. We can define what transportation is. Transportation is not electricity, it's not water, but it's not limiting. And right now what we're doing, and we've been, by the way, we've been saying that for the past 10, 15 years, as long as we've been around, we've been saying that we work in silos and we do change things. We still haven't done that. Uh, hopefully bit by bit we will. But I like to say that boundaries are defining, but they're not limiting. So if you work for a department of transport, if you work for electric utility, if you work for a water utility, yeah, yeah, you have your system. It's there. There are boundaries. Don't limit yourself. Just look yeah. at how, you know, what it depends on. You don't need to be an expert in electricity, but just don't limit yourself. I think once we get more and more, you know, in that direction, it's going to go, uh, it's going to work better. Um, and for that, we do need to have different departments, institutions, companies working together. Uh, a good example that I have here in Chicago is that we do have uh, a lot of storm water. So, we, you know, it rains a lot. The water has to go somewhere. Chicago grew. It's, it's very, very, very large. Uh, so now whenever it rains a little bit, all that water goes to the sewers. The sewers are overwhelmed. And because they're overwhelmed, you have a few things. One of them is disposal of raw wastewater in uh, surface water bodies. So, you know, really all that the, the, the water from houses, the, like the sewers from houses, all the storm water going directly in the river or in the lake. Um, so that's happening, that's nasty. And you also have something called um, um, basement backups or sewer backups. That's when people had their basements and in the basement, you really had the sewer coming back up and, and uh, flooding uh, someone's basement, which is absolutely horrible. <laughs> so the problem for that is because you have all that water that's going in the system, the system is very small. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's overflowing. So in the 1970s, the solution that was found for that was a typical engineering solution, which is, well, it's too small uh, because uh, what we need is to make those conduits bigger. If we need to make bigger then the flow, you know, we're going to be able to ac accommodate it. And actually what we're going to do is let's build those massive underground tunnels and we're going to place them on, you know, bigger than, than, than subway networks, bigger than metro networks and like in tens of kilometers of them, we're going to dump all the water there. And then when it's going to stop raining, we're going to pump it back up to the wastewater treatment plant and we're going to treat it. And, and of course, it's not working because Chicago grew and grew and it's not working. It's billions and billions and billions of dollars and it's not working. And my favorite part is, do you know where those things are, where those underground tunnels are? They're and below the, the rivers. The They're below the yeah. rivers. And why are they below the rivers? Because the rivers are owned by the water management department. I said, like, why don't you put them below a highway? A highway, you just have cars. I mean, there's not much load. Uh, the highway belongs to the Department of Transportation. I don't want to work with them, right? So I know I just want to work with, you know, myself. So I control the rivers. I'm going to put them below the rivers. And so there's really people don't work together. And that was, again, typical 1970s problem. We would never do that now. We're now we're completely changing the way that we handle uh, storm water. And all of that is happening bit by bit. It's just as human beings, you know, you want things to happen very, very quickly. You want change to happen now, but things take time. You know, it really takes time. So uh, that's that's where I, I that's where as as someone working in the field, it's very, very easy to become negative very quickly. And I do have a lot of colleagues, and I know a lot of people are very negative, you know, very you know, toxic and, and depressed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and I think you just have to remember that things things take time. So work, work for the for the for the better. And with progress, it's going to go in the right direction. We just have to keep at it and, and do it with a lot of optimism and, and, you know, while being positive. And it will happen. Not as fast as we would like, but it will happen. So I think this is a segue to a difficult to articulate question. Um, so <laughs> let me try put some pieces together. So you synthesized this caricature of infrastructure, um, which is let's make it bigger it's going to work, right? Let's yeah. add another lane. It's going to solve traffic. Let's, yep. uh, let's make the, you know, water um, collection thing a bit bigger so everybody can open the tap at full blast at the same time throughout the city and so it can work. The same with the electric grids, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. But we're seeing the limits of that, right? Or mm -hmm. we're seeing, we're also seeing on the flip side how this, affects our consumption right i mean if the the pipes were smaller then we couldn't consume as much water it's mm -hmm. it's trivial right um and so in that sense 
flow, well, infrastructure sizes um, dictate the amount of flows that are consumed, more or less, or yeah. at, or at least very intricately related. Then we have, you know, decisions about new infrastructures. So let's take uh, all of the urbanization that is happening in in Africa and Asia and all of that, right? Where they're in a dire need of infrastructures, water infrastructures, transportation, uh, health infrastructures, and all of that. And so the way that we're going to construct them now are going to dictate how they're going to consume for 40, 50 years old, some uh, 40, 50 years in, in the future. Yep. And, and so we're in this weird scenario where we have to go, go, go. But at the same time, if we miss this, then you know we're going to explode in terms of CO2 emissions, in terms of the 1.5 degree, we can forget about it and all of that. Mm -hmm. This is like a hugely daunting task. I don't know. What can we learn from the mature cities where they have a lot of infrastructure from the past for you know all of the new cities? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think there's, there's, there's two parts to this question that I could mention. The first one is, so one of the things I learned recently from the telecom infrastructure is that for the longest time, water, electricity, um, transport, it was all about quality of service. What we want is to give people what they want right now and as much as they want. So we're just going to do it bigger and bigger and bigger. We don't want you to change anything. We want to give you what you want. So quality of service. We want to have you know 100% satisfaction. The telecom industry, uh, so the internet is not owned by anyone. <laughs> the internet is that sort of uh, agreement between a lot of people and companies that we're going to have cables and we're going to have servers. And you know some people own cables, some people own servers, some people, but we have different sets of cables. No one really owns it. And so it's a lot more vulnerable uh, than other infrastructure systems. And so what they did is instead of focusing on the quality of the service, they focused on the quality of the experience. And so your internet connection might go up or down. Um, even, you know, we, I, had a, I had a connection problem right before, uh, but usually your experience is good because they want to make sure that your experience is good. With the traditional infrastructure systems, I think that's kind of where we, we should go or that's kind of where we're going now. My best example for that is the electric utility. So I have my own electric utility. Uh, when you have a power outage, you know, you're really um, you're not happy about that. So you call them up, things are not well. So what they did is they invested a lot into making sure that they had a communication system between them and their customer. Mm -hmm. And then this way, whenever you have an outage, you're told you have an outage, we're working on it. We think it's gonna be restored in two hours or in three hours or four hours, but at least you know. Before you have the power outage, you don't know. It might come back in 30 minutes, might come back in eight hours, you don't know. Um, so all they want is quality of service to make sure there's no power outages. Now they say, we will have power outages. We have trees, there's a lot of wind, some lines are gonna go down. So let's focus on that communication. And so it's quality of the experience versus quality of the service, uh, which is really one of the things I think that that's, that's big. And I think we're gonna go there with everything. You know. Um, so yeah, so that's probably something that's gonna happen in all those um, very rapidly changing cities. Um, the second one is uh, even changing the way we do things. So during my sabbatical, I did spend a few months in, in Paris, but also spent quite a few months in Vietnam. When I was in Vietnam, I, I, I was really impressed by, it, I mean, it's really changing rapidly. I spent most of my time in Hanoi. I was really impressed with the infrastructure that I had there. Some of it was not that great. Some of it was, was really, really amazing. And I got really surprised by their water system, water distribution system, because I've been really annoyed with water distribution for, for quite a few years now. Think about it. What we're doing now is we have a surface water body. So let's say it's a lake. Let's say it's a river, whatever it is. We collect the water in a big facility. We're going to treat it to make sure it's portable. And then we're going to propel it in thousands of kilometers of pipes uh, that have leaks that can break any time. And to make sure that it doesn't get too bad, we're just going to keep the pressure there all the time all the time, it's really under a lot of pressure. So we're usually around, so then yeah, we don't have to talk about units, but usually it's about 25 meters of pressure all the time, all the time, all the time. And that really requires a lot of energy. And I always think that, you know, I always say that the water um, distribution systems are really ticking time bombs because as the pipes are getting older, there are gonna be more breaks. And so what you do is as a utility company, you just have to change the water pipes as soon as, you know, whenever you see that there's a problem, you just change them, changing, and you keep changing them. 
I was like, and that doesn't make sense to me, you know, You're always, always, always on the pressure. And when I was in Hanoi, I learned how to do things there and I was really amazed. So there just for the longest time, they did not, they could not treat the water fast enough. They didn't have the facility, you know, there um, to provide for every neighborhood at the same time. And so what they would do is to service water to some neighborhoods and then others and then others, and then they would just stop. And so people, just to make sure that they have enough water, they would build a water tank in their basement. So it's in the basement so that this way the water pipe comes. Because the water pipe is more elevated uh, than the tank in the basement, water comes in. So it doesn't need to be you known know, under a lot of pressure. And then if they stop uh, uh, distributing water for a few days, they have that basement tank and they're good with that. Now, the basement tank is good, but you still need a water pump to pump to your house. And sometimes you have an electrical uh, power outage that you, know, you don't want that. So they have the big basement tank in the basement, then they have a smaller uh, uh, tank on the roof. So first they pump water in the tank and the roof, it's a smaller one, and then they just use gravity to go throughout the house. And I was really amazed with that because now you can have a water shortage for several days, they're fine. You can even have a power outage, you're fine. You can have a, you know, some kind of a fire in the house um, and no power, nothing. And at least you have some water and you can put it out. And so I was really, really impressed by that. And so because they have that, the pressure in Hanoi is a lot lower. Um, and so they don't have to go to the 25 meters. They usually are around 10 meters and 10 meters is just for fire safety. It's just a completely different way, I think, to distribute uh, water. And I thought it was phenomenal. Now people are gonna say, yeah, but you need to have those tanks and it's more, uh, it's more money. And then you know, people have to pay for it. And what if people can't afford it? I said, wait, wait, you know, let's, no, this is one possible alternative. This is there. And I, and trust me, people are in no, they're not all rich. And even though they're not all rich, you know, it's, it is a middle income country. They can still, um, you know, work with it. And then I, I told that story. I even have a little paper about that. And then people told me in India, it's like that as well. You know, a lot of places in India. And I don't think everyone is in India is, is super rich. Um, so anyway, so, so that, that thinking of just doing things differently and that thinking that what we do in mature cities is not necessarily the golden standard that we have is not necessarily what we want to reproduce everywhere, I think is, is, is the way to go as well. So learning bit by bit and hopefully not just saying, this is what we do, this is what we're good, that, that's good, and we're just going to reproduce that everywhere in the world. Um, so if we do it bit by bit learning, it little, you know, little by little, I think it's going to make a big difference. But I'm optimistic. And the reason why I'm optimistic is that we've been doing the same thing for so long that, that there's got to be better ways, right? And we're creative people. I'm sure we're going to find solutions. And so the 21st century infrastructure is what is decentralized, modular, um, adaptive, or, you know, is it going to, because you said it's not going to look like what we know, right? Do you have any... Yeah. desires or any ideas of how what it's going to look like well so usually we try we aim for two things um first one is sustainable and right now sustainable the only thing that we really can aim for is low energy so what we want is to consume as as little energy as possible and that's where we have to rethink the pumps that's where we have to think about even how we produce electricity so that's why renewables are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger so low energy is number one the second one is resilient and resilient. We're still really defining what that means. So, and I know you had a, a guest last week, you had Sarah Miro who told you all about resilience. Uh, she knows way more than me uh, about it, but that's really where we're going. And that's really where we're defining things. So you can, you know, I can even suggest you uh, someone else, you can talk to in the future about resilience of infrastructure. Um, and there's, there's Mike Chester at ASU is just really, really great for that. And he's gonna talk about uh, infrastructure has to be agile, infrastructure has to be flexible. Um, and whatever exactly that means, I think we're still defining. Um, but definitely decentralized is, is one thing we want to go. So decentralized is because for the, all throughout the 20th century, we've been centralized. So centralized means we have one big water treatment plant, one, one big power plant. We realize that now that even though you might have some economies of scale, um, because you only have one, you're just not, not as resilient. You're just more vulnerable because if something happens to that one plant, the whole system can fail. Uh, so decentralized is one and the other one is also integrated so where we start to integrate infrastructure systems together um, so that we can well, well you know enabling factors they're interdependent but we can make them enabling factors and so one form that we can integrate infrastructure is by making infrastructure more multifunctional so multifunctionality and that has that and that we're really at the tip of the iceberg really what it means but that really is part of the future because a lot of the infrastructure that we have now 
requires tremendous amount of funding, of money, of people, of effort to be able to be built. So from spending all that effort for one thing really doesn't make sense. What if we can build two birds with one stone? Why can we, what if we can do two things you know, with one system, uh, with, with one uh, infrastructure system? I have one famous example for that is the smart tunnel in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Malaysia, tropical weather, gets a lot of rain. All that water has to go somewhere. If you talk to people in Chicago, they would say, build a massive underground <laughs> um, tunnel, it's dump all the water Solution for everything. There. Exactly. And there they were like, well, this is not a bad idea. Maybe we want to do that. But you know what? It will have a lot of traffic. What if when it's not raining, we use those tunnels to have, you know, driving cars uh, in it so that we alleviate traffic a little bit. And then when it rains a lot, we just close down the tunnel and we flood it more capacity do we really need more roads i don't know are there better ways maybe but that's one way to integrate infrastructure that's a good example of multifunctional infrastructure my favorite by far my favorite type of infrastructure in the whole world what i think is the future that's going to change cities is green infrastructure i'm a huge fan of green infrastructure let's go back what is green infrastructure it's raining a lot water has to go somewhere for the longest time we just build those ditches those underground drains even though 2000 5000 years ago cities just had those ditches water falls it goes in the ditch and it just goes away so we want to get rid of it as soon as possible in the past 15 20 years we've completely changed the way we think about it now instead of because cities are so big instead of having it go away as soon as possible we want to keep it there as much as possible so we build those green infrastructure a very good example is a rain garden you dig a hole, you put some rocks. The rocks are there because they leave some void. So there's some space that's there. Um, then you put some plants. The plants are there because they have roots and because they have roots, they keep the water in. So when it, when it rains a lot, water falls, it goes there. There's a little void. So it stays there and the roots keep the water there. So we're really retaining the water in that space. And if that overflows, then we have bio swells. If it flows, we have other things. Um, so, but all of that is there and it's got really tremendous advantages, completely different way of thinking from an engineering perspective. And on top of that, just having more greenery is known to be good for um, aesthetic, for people's happiness. You know, you don't walk as fast, your economic development, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are, 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 are framed within a term that I really don't like, which is ecosystem benefits or ecosystem services. Um, <laughs> And, but really, it's, it's all good. So green infrastructure, as far as I can say, plus green infrastructure, you can put that everywhere in a city. So it's very decentralized. You integrate it usually with the transport um, because you can have also pavers on the road. Um, so it, it's for me, green infrastructure is the golden child of future infrastructure. Um, it's We should really try to get inspired by what we do with green infrastructure for everything else. And it's really got a lot, right? Getting rid of the wastewater as soon as possible. No, no, let's keep it there. With traffic, what we do with traffic now is let's get rid of traffic as soon as possible. We want to make sure that people can go wherever they want, whenever they want. So when again, go again, you know, we want them to go as fast as possible. Now we're changing. Now we're thinking about accessibility. So it's not about going wherever you want, whenever you want. It's about making sure that what you want is not too far. And if it's not too far, then you're not going to have to be stuck in traffic for two hours, right? So really completely changing the way we think. And green infrastructure is the golden child of that. Uh, and, and, I, and I love the fact that it's all about stormwater because stormwater is what really people don't care about, right? You care about getting your water. You care about not you know, having to travel too long to go somewhere. You care about getting electricity. Stormwater is what's outside. Don't care about it. But this is really transforming cities right now, everywhere in the world. As far as I know, Everywhere in the Americas, in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, you know, severe rain, especially with climate change, it is happening. So dealing with that severe rain is something that we want to do. And so all of it globally, cities through stormwater infrastructure is getting changed by the next generation infrastructure, which is a green infrastructure. I know. So you can tell, right? I know it's boring. Yeah, you, look yeah. at it, you see a little <laughs> patch of green. I'm passionate about it. I think it's been, I really think it's fantastic, phenomenal. I, I love it. Well, I mean, plus it's probably cheaper. Plus uh, it's good for for everything, right? I mean, so yeah. why haven't we thought this earlier? Anyhow, uh, it's it's good that uh, I'm very glad that we're finishing with this point. I want to ask you, okay, so is this your plan for 2021 or what is your, you you edited one book, I think in 2019. So the, the textbook, yeah. then in 2020, you had the, the other book with uh, Mike Chester on 21st century um infrastructure and then 2021 do you what do you finish or what do you have uh on the on the oven yeah 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 so um 
so, so I am writing another book. So the textbook is is a it's a big book. It's it's a textbook. It's for students. Got a lot of equations. I'm trying to write a way shorter version for the general public. Uh, I'm hoping to finish that this year. Where I think I might want to go in the future, and as I've applied for funding for that, but I don't know whether it's coming or not. Where I think I might want to go is in a completely different direction, uh, because again, I'm just a very very curious person. And I really want to go into philosophy and moral philosophy. Okay. Um, because what I see now is that engineers, we consider ourselves as spectators to the world. We, we, we're not, there are things happening, climate change, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, all those movements. We're here. We're not supposed to be swayed by that. We just build our infrastructure and it's there. And, and clearly it's not enough. So moral philosophy is about, should we build it? Should we build that? We're working on a piece of infrastructure. We have all the technical knowledge to build it. Pretty much now we can build anything. We have the technical capacity to build really pretty much everything. No, not necessarily the, the, the financial resources, but technically we can build just about everything. But should we build it from a moral philosophy point of view? Is it the right thing to do? All the interstate highways in the U.S. are really aging. Should we rebuild them or should we tear them apart? And these are not technical engineering questions. I think these are uh, moral philosophy questions. You know, even when you think about Facebook, Twitter, all those apps that are known to enable connections between people in the world, but they're also known to make people more depressed, you know, more anxious. What if the coders at the beginning, when they coded them, were, had some moral philosophy tools? to help them decide whether they wanted to work on them or not. Uh, in the US, you know, in last year, we had a big discussion about the Keystone XL pipeline. That's a big pipeline to go from Canada all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Engineers, instead of saying, it's not my role to decide whether we should build it or not, this is public policy. It's like, no, no, you're gonna design it in the end. So you have some responsibility toward it. Um, if I ask you right now what you wanna do, you're just gonna to respond to me with your opinion. I don't want you to have the opinion. I want you to have the right tools to be able to think whether you want to work and design the system or not. And so moral philosophy is, 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 is where, if, if I can, if I have the time, if I have some funding, that's really where I want to go. Um, because again, you know, from a technical point of view, we really have already a lot of tools. So it's those moral philosophy questions um, that, would, that would help us. So I don't think wow. you expected that as an answer. No, no, uh, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know what I was expecting, but uh, probably green infrastructure because you were so excited yeah. about it. But now, uh, okay, I, 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 I'm still waiting, like uh, reading something from you on this uh, on this realm. I'm very curious. Uh, yeah. On that topic, what would you recommend, perhaps either in the moral philosophy or in the infrastructure realm? Do you Would you recommend any books, any articles, any videos, movies that... Uh, relate to all of these topics? Uh, I know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, you know, you recommend books and then it takes a lot of time to read. I'll tell you, my, my, my favorite book recently is not a book, it's a short story. It takes, it takes you know, about 15 minutes to read the whole thing. Uh, so it's very, very short. And the, the, it's called The Men Who Planted Trees um, by the French author uh, Jean Giono. Giono is uh, G-I-O-N-O, -O, The Men Who Planted Trees. I have a PDF copy in French. It's originally French, but in French and in English on my website, csun.us.eu, you can just get it for free. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, but it's there anyway. Um, it's 15 minutes and I love it because it's, it's, it's almost anti-modern. You know, anti it's really about taking more time, you know, taking a step back, um, seeing how things evolve over time. And I don't want to ruin the whole story. And, it has, and I don't think I've done a really good job at that right now. So just, yeah, the men who planted trees. Uh, I do think that we, it is, I do think that we are overly focusing on solving problems right now, as opposed to changing the way that we think. So reading more fiction, um, trying to be a bit more creative, I think is the way to go. Otherwise you just stress because you want to solve a problem. And when you want to solve the problem, you use the tools that you already have. And I'm not sure that's what we want to do now. Now we just want to can disconnect from that world that exists a little bit. Um, try to go back to a world that's more human, you know, that slower pace. And so by reading fiction, and that's what you can do so that when you come back to your first problem, you just see it in a, in a completely different way. So there you go. It's not a, 
it's not a it's not a technical book at all. The man who planted trees, fifteen minutes to read, very very quickly. Um, and yeah, and you can get it for free easily on my website. I'm gonna read that to them tonight. Well, thanks a lot, Sibyl, for all of your time. Thanks a lot as well, everyone, for listening until the end. Um, please make sure to to share it around with your colleagues, your friends that also thought that infrastructure was boring, but now they're gonna definitely see the stakes out of it. Uh, and yeah, thanks again, Sibyl. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot.